A very good afternoon. I'm Aisha and I will be your host for today's webinar. Kindly note that this webinar will be recorded. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our monthly Actress Cell Therapy Lecture Series. Today's lecture by our distinguished speaker, Associate Prof. Herbert Schwartz, focuses on the efficacy of dendritic cells for immunotherapy. Associate Prof. Schwartz received his PhD in genetics at the University of Würzburg, Germany in 1989. After a postdoc at the Scripps Research Institute in San Diego, he joined the University of California, San Diego in 1991 where he cloned the human gene for CD137. In 1994, he moved to the University of Regensburg, Germany, where his group discovered and characterized many functions and aspects of CD37 biology. Between 1999 and 2004, Associate Prof. Schwarz headed the Cellular Immunology Department in Cambridge and the Preclinical Research Department at Pieris Proteolab in Germany. During his time in biotech industry, Associate Prof. Schwarz was responsible for the preclinical research and development of several drug candidates for immunotherapy of cancer and autoimmune disease. Associate Prof. Schwarz joined NUS in 2004 where his group is exploring the role of CD137 in anti-tumor immune responses with the aim of translating discoveries to human therapeutic application. Before we get started, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A window. Prof. Schwartz will address these questions after the presentation. And now, without further ado, let's welcome our distinguished speaker, Prof. Schwartz, please. Would you like to unmute yourself, Prof, and share screen? Thank you. Prof, you may need to unmute yourself. Would you like to share screen again? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, bro. All okay. good. Thank you. Okay. So, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm telling you a bit about dendritic cells and how to use them for immunotherapy and how to make them more efficient. So, um, I guess most of you may know how um, dendritic cell based immunotherapy works. Basically, let's say in this case, one has a, a colon cancer patient. So, and the patient undergoes surgery. So you resect, uh, you know, part of the malignant colon. Uh, and instead of throwing it away, one can actually take this tumor material. Of course, one can, one kills off the tumor cells. It can be done by acid or by heat or, or irradiation or whatever. And at the same time, one takes um, blood from the patient, from the blood one isolates some monocytes and, um, and the monocytes and in vitro one converts them to dendritic cells. Most commonly, there are two cytokines being used, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor and interleukin-4. And that takes around <clears throat> six days. And then on day six, uh, one adds this tumor material, right, from, from this killed off malignant cell and gives it to some uh, to the dendritic cells. Basically, one educates the dendritic cells, one tells them what to what should induce a tumor immune response against. And at the same time, one basically gives, gives them a kick by adding inflammatory agents, for example, LPS or interferon gamma. And then, and that matures the dendritic cells, they become very potent antigen presenting cells. So one gives these cells and back to the patient and in view in the patient, hopefully, cystendritic cells will encounter T cells, which are specific for this colon cancer antigens, and activate them um, so that these T cells then can uh, sway the body of the patient and eliminate any remaining residue. Uh, 
Yes. Now, this does work. And then there have been many trials where this principle, work, which has which have shown proof of principle. Um, the problem is, however, it is very labor uh, intensive because one needs, it's an individualized therapy. One needs to do this for every patient individually because every patient has a different HLA composition. So one cannot easily take cells from one patient to, to another one. And th that makes it very costly. Also because you need to catch them for you know seven days um, under GMP conditions. And when I said it works, uh, it is true. However, it doesn't work very efficiently yet. So here I listed, um, or basically I copied from um, a review article, um, a summary of uh, dendritic cell-based trials. And you can see a number of things. First of all, most are monocyte derived. Now, of course, one can isolate dendritic cells from the blood, but the problem is the frequency is very low. So instead, people use a much more uh, frequent monocytes and convert them to dendritic cells. And that takes about a week for what I said. Uh, the other thing what you can say is most trials are very small, right? I mean, 10 patients, 27, okay, here one, we found at 50. Um, and most they are phase one trials. And that tells you that because there are very few trials which go beyond phase one, so this whole field is still very much in an exploratory phase. And also, um, they have applied all kinds of cancers, you know, like epithelial um, cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, hepatic cell carcinoma. And again, that tells you there has been no cancer really defined where the endodic cells are very efficient, right? People still uh, surveying, scouting the field. And also, there, there are different protocols are being used, you know, three vaccinations, six, you know, and also how the two antigen is being uh, prepared, autologous lysate or, or peptides or mRNA. So all this point to, um, to the fact that a very efficient protocol has not really yet been uh, defined. And what you, and that is also what you see here, right? For example, you see, okay, uh, stable disease seven, partial response two, um, and um, in general, you know, it is, the efficiency is not that high. Uh, what, however, <clears throat> is in favor of uh, immunotherapy with dendritic cells is that it's generally very safe. So hardly any major uh, side effects. You know, but one could say, oh, because it's not very efficient, right? Let's say we would have a really powerful dendritic cell therapy, maybe it wouldn't so safe anymore. Right? But that needs to be seen. Now, how did, how did we get, get into this uh, field? So um, I'll tell you a bit about the background more. Basically, we, we created cells, dendritic cells, CD137 ligand dendritic cells. And um, here we have a patient, um, he has um, 2A, uh, HLA 2A, and he's CV positive. So we take monocytes from him, we convert them to dendritic cells. And that is not being done by GMCSF and we're looking for, but by a CD17 ligand agonist, and therefore they're called CD17 ligand disease. And then we take uh, from CMV, uh, we take uh, PB65, that is one of these cytomegalovirus uh, proteins. Right? So we pass the dendritic cells, we tell them against what they should mount an immune response. And then we take all the T cells, <clears throat> and after five days, we add them to the CD17 ligand disease, and then we isolate. <clears throat> the T cells, and then we test them against autologous target cells, which also have been uh, uh, passed with this uh, target cells. Basically, these T cells, if they are primed by the dendritic cells, they should recognize them and kill and lyse uh, <coughs> the target cells. So that is the experimental setup. And here is that is the result. And, <clears throat> and uh, red and red as a conventional disease generated by GMSF, Genes this F into liquid four and blue are the ones which we generated by CD1 and like disease. And that is without pulsing, so that is background. Now, here you have pulsed ones, so that's a conventional disease, and you see a significant increase in lysis of target cells. And when we generate, when we use CD1 and like disease, we get a two to three fold higher uh, anti tumor or anti target effect. And that basically, this result uh, was our entry point into this DC therapy because 
we hope, you know, if Sister Greg Sars, the cancer like disease, are two to three times more potent than conventional disease in vitro, then maybe it's also more potent in vivo, and then hopefully we can then get a better and more potent T cell response induced in cancer patients. So why are then the CD1 cell ligand disease are more potent? Mainly because they express more co-stimulatory molecules, like for example here, CD1 cell ligand disease, and this is a conventional disease. We have a lot more C70, we have a lot more CD1 cell ligand, and you have less PDL1. So in principle, high expression of co-stimulatory molecules and low expression of the co-inhibitory molecules. And so for our clinical indication, we choose nasopharyngeal carcinoma because it is prevalent in this part of the world. Um, and basically because initially when surgery, chemo and radiation therapy are exhausted, you know, then because some people relapse and then there's not that much uh, clinicians can do because for example, immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are very effective in, in other diseases are not really, have, don't have a big effect in MPC. And also another reason was because MPC is associated, associated with Epstein-Barr virus. So we have a target, we have the EBV proteins, which we can uh, direct the immune response against. So, so um, we took peripheral monocytes from the patient. We passed with peptides uh, spanning EBNA1, LMP1, and LMP2A. Uh, so we had our prime CD1 cell ligand disease, and we gave them to uh, NPC patients. Before, so that, that was the plan, but before we did that, we tested whether our CD1 cell ligand disease in blue actually are also more potent against EBV proteins compared to the conventional disease in red. And indeed, we, as you can see, we get a stronger interferon gamma response and an L-spot assay against LMP1 and also against LMP2A, so the two of the EBV proteins. We get also a stronger induction of interferon gamma by the CD1 7 ligand disease compared to the conventional disease, quite significantly actually against LMP2A, against EBNA1, and uh, it is similar for TNF. So in principle, yes, CD1 7 ligand disease can not only induce an anti-EBV uh, T cell response, but actually they are more potent than the conventional disease, which are made by GMC7 and they're looking for. Uh, also, the cytolytic activity against um, um, cells harboring EBV proteins is higher. So, for example, we, we find that the T cells, the CD1 cell ligand disease, induce stronger uh, expression of degranulation markers, of uh, cytotoxicity markers, so CD1 or 7 a and perforin, and most importantly, the lysis of the T cells, prime price of CD1 cell ligand disease, is higher than that of conventional uh, disease. <clears throat> and then we did a lot of studies. So my lab basically is a basic immunology lab. And um, for us, it was quite a new field and doing this translation to a therapy. So uh, we did a lot of things which we never thought we as a research lab would be doing. For example, we, we tested different agonists for CD1 cell ligand, we selected the best one. And then even like, how do one, how does one harvest cells, right? So, we did a lot of optimization. We um, <clears throat> selected the best, uh, most efficient uh, concentration of peptides. It was also very necessary because they are really expensive. And we tested as a cost percent. So that was a long, uh, actually a long process, but I, I cut that short. So finally, <clears throat> we started out um, doing clinical trial. And when I say we, then I have to acknowledge um, Prof. Gokuncha because he actually did the clinical part. So we prepared, uh, we discovered, we prepared the cells, but uh, Prof. Kubuncher uh, recruited the patients and treated them. So we um, selected stage four MPC patients with recurrent uh, disease or after completion of chemo and radiotherapy because many of them, or a significant proportion of them would relapse. The first arm is we only give CD1 cell ligand disease and we have completed this arm already. And the second arm, which we are preparing now, we're going to combine CD1 to 7 ligand disease with checkpoint inhibitors. Mm -hmm. And the event of the flow of events is this, you know, uh, we have set up this whole flow, which I, I will present to you. Prof. Gopenshire recruits a patient, 
um, then um, the stem cell lab at NUH is doing the aphoresis. The cell therapy facility at HSA prepares the C, uh, converts the monocyte to CD17 and ligand disease to suit test them for sterility, mycoplasma, um, uh, and bacteria. Then uh, stem cell lab stores them until, prof, uh, until the patients are ready, and then uh, prof go applies them uh, and monitors the patient. And um, uh, plasma EBV DNA is um, tested by Metsis and um, Prof Connolly and we, we test the immune parameters. So, and that is just a picture how CD17 uh, ligand disease look like from patient five. And that was our treatment schedule. So, um, aphoresis, uh, week one, and then it takes a few weeks until the cells are prepared and all the testing has been done. And then basically bi weekly intervals, the cells are being applied to the patient. And then, of course, we follow up. Uh, so we monitor tumor size progression, patient survival, of course, EBV plasma DNA, cytokines, leukocyte surface markers, and EBV activity. And that is a study calendar. You don't need to read it, all the details, but basically it was uh, quite an elaborate scheme. Okay, now we have, as I mentioned, we have completed the first arm. The good thing is because it's a phase one clinical trial, so it's only about safety. And the good news is they are safe, but that in a way was not surprising because in general, dendritic cells are safe. So we only had uh, four cases of grade one uh, related adverse effect. It's basically, you know, a reddening and a, a small infl inflammation at the injection site. But there were no high order toxicities observed and no signs of autoimmune disease. Now, of course, um, even though phase one clinical trial is mainly about safety, we also were looking at some signs of efficacy. And in total, we recruited 14 patients. Actually, we wanted to recruit 20, but basically our funds were not enough for 20. So we had to stop at 14. Um, so six patients progressed. However, four patients had a stable disease and one patient even responded. Um, she experienced a tumor shrinkage. So basically five out of this um, um, 11 patient um, had a clinical benefit and that is 42%. And that is actually not that bad. Actually, we were quite happy. And that was CD1, that so was like disease alone. And that was in patient which, who had basically exhausted all other options. Um, so therefore we hope that but once we combine the CD137 ligand disease with an immune checkpoint inhibitor, we can uh, significantly increase the patient cohort with a clinical benefit. So, I mean, what, in a way, uh, Prof. Gopun Chair, you know, who is the expert in MPC, kind of tells us is that we have very long survivors, you know, because it's a patient basically who have exhausted all our options. And then, normal survival is actually not that long. But basically now we have some of our patients survive since three years, right? I'm going. And that seems to be very unusual. So we are very happy uh, about that. Even like, you know, I mentioned in one patient, actually we uh, observed, you know, a shrinkage of the tumor. Um, and that also is, I think, uh, encouraging. Of course, it's only one patient, so I mean, maybe one can't uh, say too much, but at least it's an encouraging sign. Also, what is encouraging is that in the, in the responders, which are here in green, the green with stable disease and the blue is a responder, so the patient with clinical benefit, we find EBV DNA plasma levels decreasing, right? Okay, here, decreasing, decreasing, okay, later it goes up again. Whereas in the patient with progressing disease, we do not actually see this um, decrease, right? If anything, uh, okay, here we see a decrease, but normally it, it goes up. So at least there's some correlation with plasma DNA levels and the, uh, the clinical benefit which patients experience. Now, let's, I mean, there's dendritic uh, cells is already approved at least one, right? And um, the first one 
uh, was approved actually in, in 2005 uh, and is a DC vaccine against um, prostate carcinoma. And it targets um, prostatic acidic antigen, uh, or prostatic acidic phosphatase, and as a fusion protein coupled with gamma-side macrophage colony stimulating factors. That is one of the cytokines which is being used to prepare um, the classical dendritic cells. And, and patients get three injections. And so what is a, what is a result? What is a benefit? There's no objective response, no tumor shrinkage. However, there's an increase in survival from 25.8 to, sorry, from 21.7 to 25.8 months. It's not a lot, but hey, at least, you know, something. Now, it looks better for the three year follow up because 31.7% of the men who, who received Provenge were still alive after three years compared to 23% of the placebo. So that's uh, close to a 38% increase in survival rate after three years. So that in a way so far as a standard for dendritic cell immunotherapy. Now, is how does ours compare? It's difficult to say, right? Because ours was a phase one clinical trial and we didn't really have a, a, a control group. Right? But I mean, I think we are at, at least in the ballpark. Now, uh, this province, you know, cost one treatment costs around 100,000 US dollars, so it's quite expensive. Um, so it has a number of side effects, but basically no major side effects, and, you know, which I mentioned because dendritic cells in general are quite safe. So that's how we generate uh, CD17 ligand DC. Now, uh, kind of, I mentioned that already, so we, uh, we collect the so patient require phoresis, we collect PBMCs, and then we convert them to CD17 ligand DCs. Um, and that is basically distributed uh, all over the, so many, many facilities in Singapore are, are involved. But what is special about our protocol? Well, the special step is here, right? When we take PPMCs and convert them to sequence of a ligand disease, we do not take GMCSF and interleukin 4, what most people do. We use a CD1 to 7 ligand agonist. And that is what we think makes our cells more potent. So now I need to tell you a little bit about CD17 and CD17 ligand for you to understand uh, why we think they are more potent. So CD137 is a molecule, a co-stimulatory molecule expressed on activated T cells and only on activated T cells. So it's not on resting T cells. And so, its ligand is on antigen presenting cell, and when the two interact, the T cells get co-stimulated, and that's quite a powerful signal. And that can lead to the rejection or a certain induction of a potent anti-tumor immune response. Um, at the same time, CD17 ligand signals back into the ABC. So we have a bidirectional signaling. Now, the signaling through CD17 ligand is not the classical signaling where, where you get the induction of kinases and phosphorylation and so on. Uh, it's a different type of signaling, uh, um, <clears throat> which we are working on to decipher. But basically, it leads to activation of APC. It leads to the activation of monocytes and the differentiation of monocytes to dendritic cells, to CD17 ligand DCs. And the interesting thing is, it happens not only in the periphery, but also in the bone marrow. For example, if one takes hemorrhoidic progenitor cells and stimulates them with a CD17 protein, so a CD17 ligand agonist, then they become peripheral monocytes. And in the periphery, if the monocytes encounter, again, a CD17 ligand agonist, they become CD17 ligand DCs. Now, CD17, as I mentioned, is expressed only at sites of activation. So for example, here you have PBMCs, there's no CD17, but when one activates them, CD17 is expressed. CD17 here in green is also in the terminal center, and the terminal center has an anatomical sites where, for example, where immune responses go on, where B-cell maturation takes place. 
CD97 here in brown is expressed on vascular endothelial cells, but only at sites of inflammation. So CD97 is only expressed at sites of inflammation. And at sites of inflammation, that is where one needs dendritic cell, right? because very likely that's where an immune response is going on. So one needs disease, inflammatory disease. And I think what we have discovered is the way or one way how nature makes inflammatory monocyte derived disease. Because what people have done so far, you know, to so take monocytes from a patient, they add GMCSF and into leukin 4. But that is a very artificial way, right? Because where in nature, where in the body would we have high concentration of GMCSF and into leukin 4 for a long time? Probably nowhere, right? But we have CD1 to 7 at sites of inflammation. So we think that's how nature makes inflammatory disease. And that's why the CD1 to 7 ligand -like disease, which are inflammatory disease, are very potent. Uh, and there are a number of publications which basically uh, clearly demonstrate that it is this inflammatory disease, the monocyte derived disease, which are essential, for example, in anti pathogen immunity. Uh, <clears throat> and it is inflammatory dendritic cells, um, which, are, which have a distinct um, gene expression subset, right? And they can be found um, in of course, at site of inflammation in human patients. And so we compared, we did a gene expression analysis of CD1 to 7 ligand disease to that of mature conventional disease, immature conventional disease, monocyte, macrophages, and so on. And basically, what we find is that this transcriptome of CD1 to 7 ligand disease resembles really the profiles of uh, myeloid cells in vivo of macrophages and uh, classical dendritic cells. Also shown here. Um, CD17 ligand disease, they really cluster with um, uh, conventional disease, right? And we have a high enrichment of the CD17 ligand uh, signature gene set in the classical disease. So, in a way, they are like classical disease. However, um, and here, we, and we also compared them to disease in vivo. So. These are dendritic cells which were isolated from the knee of an arthritis patient and from the tumor stroma of a cancer patient. And you see, <clears throat> it's a CD17 ligand disease. Uh, it's a gene that is most uh, similar to inflammatory macrophages and inflammatory disease in vivo. Right? So that's why I think the CD17 ligand disease is not just an artifact, but they are very close to dendritic cells, which are generated in vivo at sites of inflammation. So, um, <clears throat> now how do we, I mean, we are already kind of quite happy that we have like a 42% response rate in our, in, in the patient cohort. I mean, even if it's a small cohort, but at least encouraging. Now, of course, we would like to get more efficacy, you know, and that comes up with the title. To, to, to the core of the title, how does one improve DC uh, based therapy? So what we do, um, we screen for um, CD137 like and agonists, which are more potent. So in our previous trial, we used 5F4. Now we have generated a new panel of anti-CD137 like and antibodies. And some of them, as you can see, are much more potent, for example, in activating monocytes than what we have used so far. Right, so also for TNF induction, P4D7 is much more potent than 5, 5F4. So hopefully it may also be more potent in vivo in making more potent CD1 cell ligand disease. Then I mentioned already, we want to combine the CD1 cell ligand disease with immune checkpoint inhibitors. So we tested that in vitro. Um, here we um, basically we combine CD1 cell ligand disease with an antibody, uh, isotype antibody, or an antibody against PDL1. And you can see that basically dose dependently from one to 2.5 microgram per ml, we can increase the response rate basically from, we can almost um, increase it by fourfold the antifrogamma secretion, which is an indication of our T cell response. 
similar for interleukin 2 and actually similar for TNF. So this data are very encouraging, or this in vitro data are encouraging that combining CD1 to ligand disease with an immune checkpoint inhibitor will significantly boost the anti tumor immune response. So we hope to see that in the patient as well. Then um, when we when we generated our CD1 cell ligand disease, right? We are, if you remember, we took peptides from EBV proteins and we passed some uh, disease. Now, this has two, um, I mean, that is very expensive, right? Because peptides and, or, and the GMP or GMP peptides are very expensive. So we generate, we established an adenovirus system and we, in the future, we hope to use this adenovirus system to pulse dendritic cells. Not only will it make, make it cheaper, but adenovirus, being a virus, uh, is sensed by dendritic cells as a danger and should, in addition, enhance the activity of dendritic cells. Also, the question is, is um, are epstein barr virus uh, proteins really the best antigen because of course EBV goes into latency, down regulates many of its proteins so it can um, escape immune surveillance. However, MPC being a tumor will acquire mutation, it has to acquire mutation, right? otherwise it will be a tumor. So, and um, um, we are also doing um, sequencing of MPC cases in the hope of identifying um, new antigens, which may be more monogenic, which can be targeted by uh, disease therapy. Also, I mentioned that disease therapy is very expensive, and that is what we also uh, experienced. And even though we were aware that disease therapy is expensive, we still underestimated the costs. So in principle, what we, what we need to do in the future, we want to transfer this dendritic cell generation process from in vitro to in vivo into the patient. So instead of using a CD17 like an agonist and maturing monocytes in vitro and then passing them with an antigen, the question is, can one do the same thing in a molecule? So for example, one takes a CD17 agonist and couples an antigen and injects that into a patient. And what we hope that basically it would, CD17 would bind to its CD17 like and and induce this inflammatory DC differentiation. At the same time, it would shuttle in the antigen so that this CD17 ligand disease generated in vivo can also present the antigen. So that is something I think which is worthwhile exploring. Um, when we generated our, our CD17 ligand disease, we actually added a molecule then, so we first we, we generated the CD1 cell ligand disease, we passed them and we matured them. And there's a maturation cocktail, we added a molecule which quenches immune activity, and, which is a little bit counterintuitive. And this molecule actually is prostaglandin E2. And you can see here, for example, for interferon gamma, once we add PGE2, we had a basic set of maturation cocktail, R848, interferon gamma, and PGE2 we get a decrease, and this decrease is because of PGE2. And yeah, so why do we do that? That is the reason because PGE2 enhances the migration of the, of the dendritic cells, because the dendritic cells get injected near lymph nodes, and then they need to migrate to the lymph node. And that is essential, because only during migration, they mature fully, um, and um, so therefore, and PG2 enhances migration. So even though we get a little bit less activate like, and less activation uh, stage of, of the disease, but by enabling the migration, so it actually facilitates a full maturation. So it's a net effect is still positive. So they migrate. And what does it do? What do they do once they have reached the lymph node? Now, some people, or initially, most people thought, yeah, okay, then they stimulate T cells, but actually newer evidence uh, says maybe not, right? Maybe they do not directly stimulate T cells. Actually, what they do is they bring the antigen to the lymph node 
and it's an influence there are cells of the dendritic cells which take over this antigen and they present it to the T cells. So basically these dendritic cells which we use for therapy are just uh, basically some the delivery guys, right? <clears throat> and so then one should actually focus, if, if one really wants to enhance DC therapy, then one should focus on enhancing the delivery capacity. And how can one do that? Now, so the reason say, or the way this dendritic cells deliver the antigen in the lymph node to us antigen sending cells is by trochocytosis, or at least that's one mechanism. Now, what is trochocytosis? It's a transfer of plasma membrane fragments and molecules or proteins inside this plasma fragment from one cell to another. This process is characterized as being very fast, cell to cell contact dependent and unspecific, although I'm not sure if it's really unspecific. So, trochocytosis is, for example, depicted here. Here are cells uh, which we transfected with. CD17 ligand coupled to M-cherry. So they're M-cherry positive, but GFP negative. We have a different type of cell. They're transfected to express CD17 coupled to GFP. When we mix the two, we get, after one hour already, double positive cells. But these are not duplets, these are singlets. And if you look at them in the microscope, we see that so a red cell, so the M-cherry positive cells, which express the CD17 ligand, it has patches of this green material, right, being yellow here. So part of the plasma membrane of the CD17 expressing cell moved over to the ligand expressing cell and vice versa. So this exchange of cell material is facilitated by CD17, CD17 ligand interaction. And there are additional receptor ligand pairs which can facilitate this exchange of material. So basically, if one wants to have a dendritic cell, ideally it should have molecules which facilitate this transfer of material. And because this transfer of cell membrane also means a transfer of MHC peptide complexes, so the transfer of antigen to dendritic cells in the lymph node, which really do the T cell activation. So I think that is an area where, which is very, very little explored and which has a lot of potential uh, to improve DC therapy. Also, um, ideally, one would have dendritic cells, which one doesn't need to make for every person individually, so that it would be a personalized, expensive therapy. Off-the-shelf DCs would be very, uh, would be ideal. But of course, a DC needs to have some right MHC. But you know, one could for the most frequent uh, DCs like A2 in uh, in Caucasians or A11 in Asians, one could prepare you know off the off the shelf uh, DCs so one can use them for more a generic allogeneic vaccine. Other people uh, develop artificial dendritic cells, basically spheroids or not spheroids or or particles, um, uh, exosomes, or or whatever, uh, but basically, you know, they can uh, code with antigen MHC peptide complex and co-stimulatory molecule, and that could also be uh, used as a DC. Now, how efficient they are needs to be tested. Similar, like synthetic dendritic cells, which can be is like a polymer, right? a long polymer. And then instead of uh, also coated with MHC peptide and costumulatory molecules, instead of uh, coating them on some micro or nanoparticles. So I would like to uh, summarize what I basically told you so far. Um, CD17 ligand signaling induces differentiation of human monocytes to CD17 ligand dendritic cells. The CD17 ligand uh, dendritic cells are different in morphology, cytokine expression, and cell surface marker expression from these conventional dendritic cells, which are generated by granulocyte macrophage, colony stimulating factor plus interleukin 4. And most importantly, they are more potent in inducing uh, cytolytic activity of T cells. 
the CD177 lagenesis are very similar to the dendritic cells which are found in vivo at sites of inflammation. So I think they have some physiological relevance. <clears throat> and that is because expression of CD177 is strictly activation dependent only at sites of inflammation. And therefore, I think induction of CD177 ligand signaling is a mechanism how nature generates this monocyte derived inflammatory disease in vivo. CD177 ligand disease induces a potent anti Epstein Barr virus T cell response. And by implication, because MPC is associated with Epstein Barr virus, so we can use this um, CD177 ligand disease induced anti EV response for therapy of MPC. So we completed a phase one clinical trial in patients with relapsing and or metastatic MPC. What we can say are uh, that CD177 ligands, ligand disease are safe. We have early signs of efficacy, like we have five of 12 patients, of, of 11, pay, of, uh, five of 12 patients or 42 percent uh, responded with a clinical benefit. And we are working on improvements. Now, when I say we, then of course uh, it's a large team. So, uh, my team kind of developed the CD17 ligand disease. Um, uh, then we collaborated with uh, Prof. Kubun Chair in basically in, in setting up a, a clinical trial. And there were many uh, people involved, especially as a cell therapy facility of HSA, who prepared the cells, the stem cell lab at NUH, uh, the single hemorrhage network. Uh, which did uh, help us in doing the characterization of CD17 ligand disease and also atomic fertility from whom we got many reagents. And of course, uh, funding of um, our research and of the clinical trial was from NMRC. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, please let uh, us know. Thank you, uh, Prof. Schwartz, for a very elaborate presentation on your work. We will now proceed with the Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions, please type your question in the Q&A function, and we will take your question accordingly. Alternatively, you may want to click on the raise hand button, unmute yourself, and proceed to ask questions. All right, we have a question from Jeremy Ng. Question is, were there specific EBV strains that were associated with clinical response? Um, we actually did not look at EBV strains. So we did, um, unfortunately, so I can't really answer this question. Okay, I see. Thank you, Prof. If anyone else has any questions, um, you may type your question in the Q&A function and we'll take your question. Or alternatively, you may click on the raise hand button, unmute yourself and proceed to ask questions. Okay, one question here. Out of curiosity, how about HLA typing? Was it done? Um, this is a question from Jeremy Ng. Yeah. Um, no, we also didn't do HLA typing. I mean, it yeah, it would be kind of someone it, it was not really necessary for us, you know, because we used the autonomous cell. Also, it would be interesting to know. But as I said, you know, we um, we run out of funds, funds anyway, so um, if you would have done HLA typings, that would have cost additional money and, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have, we have, uh, we, at least from some patients, we still have cells, so it could be done. 
So we have another question from Dan Liu. Dan Liu. What would the manufacturing be like for phase two trial? Are there any specific bioreactor or culture where in mind? Um, so, I mean, phase two may not be, in terms of preparing the cell, it would probably not be very different from phase one. So we don't produce any specific uh, material. So all the material which we are used is, uh, in terms of plastic ware, is, um, you know, it's a conventional plastic ware. Uh, of course, you know, because it's the only thing what, what is kind of unusual or what is non, what is special is that we use wherever possible GMP material for the reagents. But in terms of, you know, uh, dishes, cultured dishes, it's uh, the same. It's the usual what we normally use in the, in the, in the lab. Right. If anyone else has any further questions, please start your question in the Q&A function and we'll take your question. Or alternatively, you may click on the raise hand button, unmute yourself and proceed to ask questions. All right, at this point, um, I don't see any further questions from the audience. So we will wrap up our session. On behalf of Actress, thank you very much, Prof Schwartz, for the enlightening presentation. And to all our audience, thank you for attending today's lecture. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.